Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of the Comedy Defect Podcast. My name is Winter Fonander, I'm a comedian, and if you haven't figured out by now, I am the host of this show. This is the 27th episode that we're recording. Yes, we've done 27 of these, and this is one of my favourites, this is with Declan Kennedy. Declan Kennedy is a comedian, and he's a radio producer. He has worked for the BBC Every time I've met Declan at gigs, he's been always such a lovely fella. And I thought, let's get him on the show and and just get to know him a little bit better. But talking to Declan is great because he's got the same, the same gnawing sort of self-awareness and self-judgment that I have. Every time he says something, he'll heckle himself. It was great. I love talking to Declan. We talked for a lot longer than this interview went on. Declan, lovely guy, very funny man. If you haven't seen his stuff, go check him out. Go follow him on Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. Now, if you like this podcast and you want to donate to us, you can find us on Patreon. Just go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defect Podcast, donate as much or as little as you want. But if you can't kick something back, just leave us a nice, honest review on iTunes or Podbean, because that really helps, guys. It's Christmas. Merry Christmas. What has been going on in my life? Well, I'm actually recording this from the comedy container right now. Or the man cave. Or the uh, prison. Or the safety. The bunker. Yeah, so I finally moved in with my wife. Yes, we're fully married now. We're living together. And this is the first day that we're living together. I haven't slept in the same bed yet. But I like to do things right. I don't like to rush these things. It's been three months since we've been married. So now I've finally moved in fully, guys. Fully there. So things are going to start moving. I have the whiteboard. It's not up on the wall yet of the comedy container, but that is happening. Yes, it is all happening. Most of the things are in place in the comedy container. The couch is in the right place. The, there's a light. There's a desk. The, most things are in the right place. But I'm editing this episode and doing the links at three o'clock in the morning because I haven't quite finished putting everything in the right place. Not that I'm OCD or anything. Yeah, I just got a bed with her. No, I need to finish this. So guys, I hope you really enjoy this episode with Declan Kennedy, number 27. It's a really good one. I'm really happy with this. Such a great guy. Check Declan's stuff out as well. Declan Kennedy, episode 27. Enjoy. So Declan Kennedy, welcome to The Comedy Defect. Thank you very much for having me, Winter Fernando. And yeah, I like to do full names at the start, so we That's all it. know exactly who we are. So you can follow you. Yeah, keep yeah. a formal. <laughs> <laughs> no rapport whatsoever from the beginning. <laughs> That's how I like it. Yes. So, so how are you anyway? Oh, I'm not too bad this afternoon. It's it's mm. uh, it's uh, fairly calm. You know, uh, mm. I always get that creepy feeling. Uh, I don't know about you. I get this feeling nowadays. The older I get, the more uh, you, you feel like relaxation feels wrong. Do you oh, have that yeah. feeling? Of, always. You get always. That, that feeling of mm. oh, this is I'm calm. What well, something's going to happen now? Or something's what have off. I forgotten? Yeah. Or there's something I've not thought about, or it's, or it's a weird, and I know it is a recognised psychological thing that actually after a while anxiety becomes comfortable, and actually getting out of the comfort zone is the reverse of what it is normally. That actually when you're calm and relaxed, that start that becomes a kind of reverse anxiety. It's really sorry if I completely you, terrified you. There. You've terrified me completely now, and now yeah. I'm, now, I'm, now, I'm, now <laughs> I'm going, you've turned my world upside down. Literally, I'm, I'm a minute in and already I've. Just completely destroyed all hope. <laughs> Can you just like do the old trope? Go, no, I'm just going to let you go with the truth bomb now, okay? Just to warn the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll try and give you. I'll try and give you a trigger warning if I'm yeah, going to just, just you know remove all placidity from your life. I totally get that though. Though the with the the anxiety is, is the relaxation, and the relaxation is the anxiety yeah, now. It's weird. Exactly. You keep checking your when you're sitting there, uh, uh, maybe anxious. I don't know now. I don't know what to call it now. Just yeah. at the normal state then. Yeah. You know, I don't check my pockets for lists, but when I'm relaxed and nervous, then I will be checking my pockets for lists. Yeah. It's, That's right. Do you ever feel like, increasingly, you think, isn't it a shame there's no one who can ask for permission mm. to have fun? Do you ever mm. feel like that? You feel like, if I could just ask someone, is it, is it okay if I just relax a bit now? I've got a wife now, so she, I, uh, that's how I'm <laughs> at. <laughs> it's just that you feel like there should be, they, they're, they're almost like there should be an office or people wandering around mm. in high vis tab arts mm, mm. going, it's, it's alright, yeah, just the next hour, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah relaxation, go. That's yes, sort of thing, like a clock. You know those drunk wardens that you mm. see hanging around? Oh, um, have you never, you're not familiar with this? No. The concept of drunk warden, I think, is, it be, it's, I mean, I feel like I'm putting ideas in people's heads if they hear this, but. It seems like an idea that's so ripe for subversion mm-hmm. by criminals that basically... I've seen it in action as well. I didn't know what it was when I was looking at it, but 
basically there is now, I'm not sure if they're volunteers or employed or what, but if you're planning a night out, mm. and now that I come to describe this as a mark of, of how alcoholic Britain is, you can, I don't know if you hire people or you let them know, or like I said, whether they're volunteers, but they will show up and herd you on your night out, and if you're too drunk, they will be the ones who sort of go, okay, now it's time to get a cab, now it's time to... Do you know, get your keys out, yeah. and, and, and like a chaperone sort of thing. Yeah, like a sort of adult mm. chaperone. I mm. saw this. I was in a cybercaf a few years ago, mm. and um, well, late to the party with a laptop. Mm. I think so. I used to use cybercaf, and it was late at night, and I didn't know what was happening. I thought, what am I looking at? There's a very drunk Japanese girl who just could not. She's supposed to be boarding a flight the next day. Could not even sit up straight. Certainly couldn't understand anything that was being said to her. This guy and I was going, okay, it's time to. And I thought, is this legit or am I witnessing a kidnap? Because mm. you feel like if you are going to take advantage of anybody, all you need to do is put on a high still and wait. For... Yeah, I'm your drink warden. Yeah. yeah, totally I am. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. I've got you covered. You're fine. Yeah, just yeah. into the back of this car. That's Yeah, fine. that's... that's, that's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, dodgy. It's, so I feel like we should have something like this sort it, of anxiety. It's the opposite. Yeah, that, that'd be good. But it's yeah. the opposite of the 18 to 30s. Never been on one of those holidays. Yeah. But 18 to 30s sort of like rep. And they kind of go, hey, let's get drunk. Yeah. And it's the opposite. Okay, right. And, and now, but it's like, okay, time for you to go home now and into a cabin. Yeah. And they sort of like, it sounds like they kind of ruin the fun, really. <laughs> you know, that's just the, I mean, not saying that, that, saying that, that, that poor, that poor woman would be like, could, could really be, you know, abused and whatever it is, you know, could take, be taken down a really dark path. Yeah. But they, that's the, just the time when stuff gets interesting, when you don't, what happened last night? I don't even know. Do you remember? Well, I don't want to know. Just, do we have fun? Yes, we did. It was awesome. That's all you want. That's all you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've, I've taken his down a down path very quickly. I'm very Jaeger sorry. bombs. Jaeger bombs. So that'd be the time to go, look, he should have like a bottle of Jaeger with uh, some Red Bull with him. Go, now's the time for a Jaeger bomb. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. He would have a couple. Yeah. Say, okay, to pep you up, isn't it? Okay, yeah. no, you, you you can't walk. You need something to just wake yourself up a little bit. There you go. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, it needs a bit of energy. Uh, nobody can steal that idea. I'm going to drag it. That's down. fine. That's yeah. fine. It's all. It's been logged now. So that's yeah, fine. That's, that's it. it. I had a post yeah. on the notes. Right. What have you been up to then, Declan? Have you been writing a show for the Fringe this year, or? Oh God, I mean, I've got um, I've sort of got a vague idea as I had last year for mm. a show for the Fringe. But um, I'm sort of at that stage, like, well, if I apply, I never know if I have the kind of profile that would net me a sort of, uh, a, a, a sort of good venue of time. You know, I'm quite mm. fairly low key as a comedian. I haven't really won anything particularly. Um, in fact, I, my CV as a comedian just looks really odd. One or two minor sort of acting parts and things. Yeah. Um, minor brush with, uh, with yeah. success. That's it. No, <laughs> that's no, like it's an injury, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's it's that minor it. injury with yeah, it, like, yeah, that's, uh, you know. That's, that's <laughs> it. Physio says I'll be back to <laughs> back to being a no hope soon. But <laughs> therapy, whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's it. Didn't, didn't suit me. Didn't suit. That's, no, it. No, no, yeah. that's <laughs> it. But I actually think about the, the two times I've sort of popped up in people's things. You know, comedy blap when I was in Tim Rankin's mm. pilot. Mm. Both times I've been fussing around a vehicle. So I'm kind of, I'm sort of thinking, well, maybe that's my thing, maybe in the De Niro of, of car boot mm. acting, that I'm perpetually getting things out of car boots mm. in other people's comedy programs. So yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe that's my thing, I don't know. Yeah, get so. a van, maybe get a van and yeah, have a bigger it. park. That's yeah. it, yeah, just expand it to buses, <laughs> yeah. planes, just unloading from ever-increasing amount of vehicles, yeah. So, yeah. hardware, and, and, you know, ultimate would be yeah. the sort of porter on the Starship Enterprise. Yeah, you've, like, you've got two jobs. You can take the kit there and you can also be in the show. Yeah, that's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I could uh, yeah, call on that market. So, yeah. You're from Ireland originally, is that right? I'm of Irish descent. Mm. So my dad's dad came mm. over from Ireland. Um, I'm not sure when, but presumably pre-war. Well, it would be pre-war. Mm. My dad was born sort of in the last year of the Second World War. And what part? Uh, I, do you know what? I'm not in touch with my Irish I think Waterford. Oh, yeah. I think, well, I couldn't tell you that. I'm probably thinking that's very central island. Mm, yeah, Waterford is like east side. East side, mm-hmm. right. Okay. Yeah, where the crystal comes from. Right. Oh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I'm completely with you. Mm-hmm. So, so I've, I've only ever been to Ireland once in my life after graduating university to Ballina, I think it was. All right, yeah. Coast, yeah, which is mm. a, a lovely place. And, um, do you support Crystal Palace? I, I, I don't. I, do you know what? I'm the. I just don't have well, any football. I'm not into it either. It's okay. No. We can we can cut this football conversation <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, it's only England football. I have no that's, idea. That's, I, I hate it. Was was this? Yeah, we actually. I, hate it. I, I can't. I can't. Well, football, the World Cup maybe just for like you know for, yeah. for rivalry yeah. and the tribal sort of reasons. But like apart from that, no interest in it whatsoever. My dad is a big football supporter. Mm. He's a Man City. Um, so obviously, yeah, he's had many many years of penury. Mm. Well, Man City sort of you know mm. with a. The, the kind of outside chance for a lot of matches. Yeah. Uh, all I know is that he had many years of of keeping the faith against all odds, and mm. then now I think in recent years they've kind of shot up the 
people's in people's estimation. Mm-hmm. But did he move to Manchester when he first came over, or where was that? Uh, well, my, my granddad. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. I think yeah, I think he settled sort of outskirts of Manchester, Salem, mm-hmm. Michigan way. And um, when my dad was born, it, I think he, he sort of settled there. And I th- I th- like a lot of people came over from Ireland, I think it was a work thing. That's Economic it. migrants Same. would call them Mao. That's Hungary. it. Broke. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and you're, you're, and so when you st- you started comedy, but was your your family into any performance, to play instruments, or any sort of thing like that? Or? Depends how you look at it. I'm not traditionally. No, my parents didn't uh, weren't uh, sort of performers in that sense. Didn't um, I'm certainly not playing music. I did have guitar lessons when I was in my teens, mm. but I never. I sort of bottled on it after a mm. while. It sort of came to an end when I was about seventeen. And like a lot of people, you think, oh, I wish I'd sort of kept that up. Mm. But it is actually quite common if you get a guitar and looking after an electric guitar. It's like having a mm. pet or something. Or oh, really? Guitar. Yeah, no, it's sort of things like having to keep it clean and replace the strings. That oh. is what eats up cash and time. And that's, that was difficult when it sort of got to A-levels and degree and what have you. So I've not sort of picked up a guitar in years. Now people have thought in my head, I don't know, who knows? We can uh, yeah, start, start again. But yeah, man is back. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. My, my, <laughs> so, you look pained there when you said uh, when you said, "Oh, you know, I haven't picked up anything so many years." Oh God, I hate myself. I know. It's the anger. Oh, I, mean, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be in a band. I'd be the lead singer, uh, the lead guitarist. Everything. Yeah, it would have changed things. That would have been a BBC Four documentary or something. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's sort of Goes on Amazon right now with Prime. Buys a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Starts. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, but now my dad, I suppose he could say my dad had to always had, um, uh, always still has great skill with public relations. That, that he was for many years he was a trade union official, right? So and he was the one who um, was very good at dealing with the media because um, he sort of uh, he took on that occupation at a time I guess when television was on the rise and what have you. So he had quite a good handle on how to deal with TV reports and things. And like I said, the seventies and eighties was the time. And it was, uh, all that workplace sort of industrial angst was much more up the news agenda than it seems to be these days. So mm. local news programmes would always sort of come to him for comment on a strike and what have you. And he got quite good at sort of doing press releases and dealing with that. So I suppose there was that kind of antecedent in mm. my family history. Yeah, yeah so it's yeah, public speaking, yeah. That's yeah. It. And like, you know, kind of a bit of double talk as well. I had to get the script Advocacy, just right. Yeah. You can't really, you can't say definitely, but we're going to talk around the subject for a yeah. little bit. Okay, yeah. you know, a little... Uh, Little, what's that thing? That little uh, oh, spider diagram in the middle. There you go. That's yeah. the subject we're talking about now. Don't talk about those things. Don't talk about that. <laughs> I think my dad was the other. He was very much more direct. That right. whatever he was asked, he would just say what he wanted to oh, say. Yeah. Apparently, that is a, that is a good thing to do if you interview. Just whatever you're being asked, you know. Yeah, just drive home whatever point. Because particularly TV, well, you don't get long really to sort of put your case. Mm. So that's true, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Before they come at you with a question, just to try and knock you off your pedestal. Sort yeah, of thing, knock you off your perch a bit. But mm. also, it's just because you know that it's going to be cut down. Mm. And, and if you've been very definite about it, that's the thirty-second chunk that's going yeah. to be on the time. So and without without any comments, just keep going. Doesn't fucking just bludgeon it through. That's it. No, 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 <laughs> you that's can't it. edit this anymore. Yeah, that's, oh, that's the other thing. Yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah mm. you need to say something that they can't possibly edit around. Mm. So. Is your old master of life? Yeah, no, he's, he's still uh, he's still out. He's still mm. sort of. Uh, He's, uh, he's an artist now, actually. Oh, so, yeah, right. He's done a lot of things in his life. He's, mm. uh, yeah, he's a tremendous, uh, tremendously inspirational. What kind? Watercolours, mainly. Right. But I know he's, he's just started, he's done this whole progression uh, since becoming a widower. He sort of started off doing art and then getting involved with art class and then gradually sort of college and now he's sort of doing degrees at university. Oh, wow. So he's now getting into um, conceptual art. So yeah, no, he's a big fan. He's been he's a big convert to Grayson Perry. So I did wonder, like, if I'm, you know, going to have a trip home at the weekend and yeah. find him sort of in the dress having him embraced that particular aspect of Christmas. Fair play to him if that's the, if that's the yeah, case. Yeah, fair. And so, so, yeah. so your mum died recently, is that right? Uh, 2007. Oh, 2007. Right. Mm-hmm. So, mum died. Yeah. So it was, yeah. Mm-hmm. So. And was she, was she in creative as well? or Not in that sense, no. I think they're both parents. Like a lot of people, a lot of people think have creativity that isn't necessarily expressed this mm. way. So I always hesitate to say, oh no, they definitely weren't because, mm. yeah, like I say, everybody has that spark around them. I think uh, I think she's sort of happy to be mother and you know, mm. wife, like, which is quite a that is quite a full time job. Mm. I think, mm. raising particularly me, I wasn't an easy or particularly mm. approachable child. I'm an right. uh, only child. Right. It's always a, a weird thing, just as a time zone. It's always a weird thing when you. I, I've noticed this as well. You meet other people who were only childs. We mm. never, we never actually stop saying I'm an only child. And I have the the be- this is in many ways the most brutal heckle I've ever had as a German lady. She was I, was, I did a bit on stage about this. <laughs> And she just put her hand up. She was being very, very well meaning. She didn't, you know, mm. she wasn't in any way trying to derail me. She said, uh, But at what point do you stop being a child? 
And I thought, well, it's true, really. I'm mm. a middle-aged man now. <laughs> Can't really say I'm an only child. <laughs> but it's true, you never lose that sense of mm. being an only child. Mm. Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether that's a sort of, um, you know, I guess one child is, is, is enough work. But um, mm. I do know that my dad was the opposite. He's one of 15 brothers and sisters. Wow. Yes, that's it. Irish Catholic, you see. So, you know. That's a that's, lot. That's yeah, it's a lot. lot. It is a lot, so... Yeah. But it's a weird thing, again, with the tangent, with that amount of genetic material being passed out, um, it was inevitable, but I haven't met my double. Yeah. That's a weird... So, so, but I, I at a funeral, at one of my uncle's funerals, mm. that, um, it suddenly got away. The person stood in front of me, I, I thought, well, I've not seen the back of my head, but mm, this looks really weirdly familiar. And then yeah. he turned around, I thought, oh, this is unnerving. This is taller, slimmer, better dressed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 2.0 version. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's, Upgrade. Yeah, that's it. Wow. It's, yeah, it was the next, you know, the next Apple product. Yeah. It's, yeah, Crazy. it's a weird, weird, particularly at a funeral to have that sensation of, oh, okay. Yeah. Did you like, I felt like you'd fight to the death. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. It's like, oh, what happens now? I have to prove my worth, you know. That's it. This, you You'll know, be erased. That's it. That's it. Yeah, T100 versus the T1000. Yeah. It was that sort of situation. Yeah, that's know. it. But how, long, how many years have you been coming to Kenny? It's really quite a difficult question to answer because I've probably been doing it very slowly over a very long period of time. But I can never... I, I feel like stand-up is a fairly recent thing. I've, I've had a sort of prehistory of how I came to comedy was through writing. Mm. Actually, I was a huge... Growing up, a huge fan of radio comedy. Sort of all the stuff that's on Radio 4. A like um, goon show and stuff uh, like So that. eventually, yes, it sort of came to the goon show, but a Hitchhiker's Guy was my big light bulb moment when right. I was about 11. Yeah. The, and it's a weird thing as well because it was the TV version of Hitchhiker's was on a lot mm. in the 80s. But for some reason, I'd seen it many times before, but I suddenly watched it at the age of 11, and it was like a, a thing, you know, flick. I suppose you're getting into puberty, you kind of, everything was, yeah. it's starting to change, and mentally and physically, you're sort of uh, on that cusp. Uh, suddenly, I'd sort of got it, mm. and I badgered my parents to get me the book, and on the cover of mm. the old print of the book, it said, based on the famous radio series, which is the first time I became aware that, oh, there's, there's comedy on radio too. So I went to, I think they repeated it on the radio a few years after that as well, and that sort of led me into the world of radio comedy, and... Eventually, uh, when I was sort of at university, that was one of my aspirations. I thought, oh, I'm going to see if I can do radio comedy. I think that that's sort of the way that that, that is written anyway is very tangential. I think that being in your teenage years and reading that, it's like, oh, this is this is for me. This is like... Yeah, oh, that's it. Oh. And like that bit, especially, the, the I read the book, I didn't see the series. Yeah. But that bit with the when that whale just... Ma- materializes in space yes and is co- hurtling towards the moon and you're like oh this is totally I totally get this and then this is the brilliant, thought brilliant. process is so I- I'm not going to ruin it for everyone who hasn't no. ever read it but it's the funniest bit of that whole book I was like oh that is that, the Hitchhiker's guy it was brilliant and, uh, you know one of the bits uh, anyway you know the bit I'm talking about Brilliant. Yes, I cried laughing at that. That bit. was that was yes, that is easily one. And I don't know. Again, I don't want to ruin it for. Um, can we have spoilers or something like this? For no, I know, but it is. It, it, people will read it. And yeah, I, I don't, you know, it's one of the best bits as well. Yeah, but I, yeah. I was I was very lucky actually because it was very limited print run. I got a copy in my teens of the script book, the, mm. the original radio scripts, which was brilliant because it had notes from Douglas Adams about the process of writing and recording the radio series, but also Jeffrey Perkins, who's a producer, right. who went on to become quite a sort of legendary figure mm. in broadcast comedy. But um, Douglas Adams talked about the origin of that character of the whale, because he was always, always, always... Uh, have, he was always fighting off writer's block, and he would just mm. inspiration he would just take from anywhere. And he talks about the whale being inspired by an episode of Starsky and Hutch, <laughs> where like a minor character was just shot, and nobody mm. gave a flying one. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'm going to write a minor character mm-hmm. and make people care about his death. <laughs> totally. And I'm going to make it a whale because no one will mourn a human being. <laughs> and you think that's such a brilliant starting point. It's such a dark starting point as well. It was so sad as well. Yeah. It's such a sad moment. Yeah. It's like, oh, this poor lonely whale. And it's just, oh, it's, it's so good. It also, so also good. just on that, that is one of my favourite comedy things, a best ever callback. I don't know mm. how much of the Hitchhiker's books have you read because I don't know. I've only read the first one. Okay. Because if you get to the third one, there's a, there's a brilliant callback to that right. whale thing right, that okay. explains the bowl of petunias. What is, what, what is, what's the name of that? Is it the, the, you've got Hitchhiker's Guide and you've got the... Restaurant at the End of the Universe. Right, I haven't read that one yet. And, okay, and then the one I've is Life, the Universe and Everything. Right. Um, I, again, should I mention this? I don't want to ruin it for anybody. Uh, no, I, 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 I want to find out though. I don't know. Well, this, <laughs> I'll read it. I'll read it. That's fair, but I'll people, Hitchhiker's fans who are listening will know the bit great I mean. Callback. Okay, great. It's a brilliant bit halfway through the third book where everything just stops while suddenly this character appears. Okay. 
and it, it suddenly you get yeah, a whole new perspective mm. on the whale incident. Okay, brilliant. Um, particularly in respect of the bowl of petunias that gets created at the same time. I've got to do my research. That's absolutely. it. And it's worth, and also the radio version, it does that really well when okay. they went back and adapted the, the remaining mm. books into the radio version. That is still one of my favourite bits of radio comedy. Is and so it? you did a, a degree in, in what? I did a, an English degree. Oh, yeah. I, I'm still growing up. I, I still, I guess lots of people, again, must have this sense of just being fundamentally not a good adult. So the only thought I had on doing A-levels was, like, I was pretty good at English. I'll go and do that to degree level. And I got in at Lancaster. And it was only towards the end I was sort of thinking, well, what do I actually want to do with mm-hmm. my life? And at that age, again, I, well, the thing people don't talk about, there is that thing when you're in prison, I'm just feeling like I can't do any of this. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I thought uh, I would, you know, eventually I did try was sending sketches off. To, mm-hmm. At that time, in radio comedy, there were shows of what they call an open door policy, which they still sort of have, but I think the landscape has changed. But yeah, there were, there were shows that openly invited you, like if you think you've got a funny idea, here's mm-hmm. the format, here are the guidelines, yeah. send us something. And if you, know, if you can see him, if he makes a producer the cat and the cast laugh and they perform it and it makes the audience laugh, mm. it will make it into the finished thing and you'll get mm. a little bit of money for it, which is you know, a mm. grand feeling. When yeah. You, so, so I had some success with that. So you did that and then when was the first time you decided to perform this? Did you already perform the sketches or did you just write them and get someone else to perform them? Oh, well, well, that was the thing. I mean, I should uh, uh, stay here and now in the interest of full disclosure for anybody listening who wants to seek out my prehistory. Mm. And there must be loads of those. <laughs> um, that, that, was a, that was under a different name. So that's, that would be, um, should we meet in person, dear listener? Maybe I'll fill you in there. But, um, but yeah, so that was, that was before I had any thoughts of performing really at that point. Right. It's a shame really. This is a thought I've had since recently middle ages that I didn't know it was possible in my teens to do stand I'd always harboured a secret ambition to be a writer and I'd always you know you watch comedy on television and I think that's probably how we all start exactly. uh, things like Hitchhiker's then you see somebody doing stand up mm. particularly I feel like in the 80s and 90s stand up was much more cerebral yes that you can actually do quite high concept things with mm. stand up but yeah no I, I, I sort of wish I had known that at the mm. age of 18 that actually if you can overcome any sort of fear of being seen and heard in public if I'd known that I'd started much earlier but purely transferable for everything isn't it yeah yeah and and, yeah. and you would have you would have and there was no there was no proper route back then was there it was like all oh, these all oh, these people just are there well they, they sort of was but you don't become aware of it until mm. you're actually doing it that mm. oh yeah this is how people you know have done it historically mm. that you know that, that it probably was but and you sort of had that private thought of all well, there are much less people doing it then. Probably could have, gone, could have gone much further, much faster. But that would be to sort of be a great, do a great disservice to you know anybody else doing it right now. But, you know, we're all, yeah. um, you know, we're all doing our best, and you know, some pretty good people out there. Mm. And, uh, and wish them all well. <laughs> um, uh, that that just sounds sarcastic. That's all it. It just so uh, you well, uh, look in your career. <laughs> that idea would be quite genuine. <laughs> that idea for those guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's no way for me to back out. Of this no, there's not. There's <laughs> not. I mean, even I know. I think you have the same issues as me. Even when you're saying something sincerely, you sound sarcastic. You're like, oh, no, yeah. well done. Yeah. Well, no, well done. No, really, well done. Oh, that's it. It's too late now. Uh, that's it. No, 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 you can't. You can't. Make... There's a there's a, a, a girl from Russia doing stand up mm. a few years ago, and um, she said to me one evening, "Oh, I don't want to do this." Not the world's best Russian accent. I do apologise. I don't want to do this this evening. Uh, I do feel quite ill. I was going, "Oh, well, poor you. You should probably rush your." Why are you being so sarcastic? And I was, well, I'm not. I'm actually being quite genuine. So I think it's part and parcel of being you know, British or yeah. you know in Britain for any length of time. It just yeah. turns you mm. sardonic. Yeah. Whether you mean to or not. Yeah, for um, sure. But and, and you have way more facial expressions than she did. It's like, well, this guy's giving way too much, you know, facial <laughs> yeah. heat to this not, situation. Not sarcastic with his voice, yeah. his face is like... Really giving it, committing to this sarcasm. Yeah, he's really... What an asshole! <laughs> 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 but I, I, to answer your uh, to answer your question, I actually sort of had this chaotic. Re- I've I had such a chaotic route through everything. Yeah. I was now just have not had a normal CV at all. But I had um, I sort of left university and did not know really how to pursue. Apart from, um, I think I saw a psychologist for a while. I said, "Why am I oh, so yeah. happy?" Because I sort of got this job in the civil service. I wasn't any good at it, to be mm. honest with you. And that became you know apparent after mm. ten months in that job. And I said to the psychologist, well, I don't know why. And she said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do this. She said, well, why don't you just do it? And I said, but how do I? She said, well, you're not going to be, you're not going to know, you're not going to be any happier. So you might as well yeah. <laughs> just be doing something you want to do. So I did that and I sort of, this job the civil service came to an end. And I wound up, I was still living with my parents at the time because I hadn't worked out. Most people, they leave university and the first thing they do is move mm-hmm. to a different city and mm-hmm. commence their glorious career. I had none of that. I didn't mm-hmm. know what I was doing really. and still don't. But I, I sort of, after that, this job, and I, I wound up as a lollipop man. 
I know, you should look amazed. And mm. uh, uh, also working part-time in a bookshop. Mm. So while I was doing that, I was sending stuff in. And I just started to have sort of a glimmering of mm. a success every so often. Right. That, um, just enough to keep you on, on the... On yeah, the on the, to know that I was sniffing. And it is very, very gradual. Anyone mm. who's listened to this who is going down that route at the minute, yeah. I t- to completely understand how hard it, it is mm. to sort of... To, you feel like you're just so tiny. The, the, but it mm. is forward momentum. And mm. you have to sort of do it and, and have faith that you... If you do it enough, you, you you know it will it will sort of you'll chip away a little bit, and that will give you some sense that you're you're heading in the right direction. Um, I'm gonna hit you with a really cheesy line now from Rocky. And it's like it's it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get hit and you keep moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. it's I'm such a cinema, cinematic uh, philistine, a philistine, yeah. if you will. Yeah. But um, I'm, I'm not at all familiar with the Rocky. Well, so no, this is like, new to me. I have been, uh, you might tell by me knowing that quote yeah. way too well. I've been watching an awful lot of motivational uh, conversations from YouTube recently. Oh, yes. No, that's always... A, yeah, there's lots, so much of that material now. Kind of dangerous, to be fair. It's kind of dangerous stuff, because you're like, whoa, yes, now I'm going to go to bed now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're lying there going, tomorrow it's going to be different. <laughs> and, you know, that, and then you get obsessed with listening to these things, and yeah. then your life just slips past you, and you go, what am I doing with my life? I'm listening to motivational things. That's it. Again, destroying my life. Yeah. <laughs> Filling it with shite from other people. Uh, that's well. it. Yeah, that's it's it. some of these motivational things are motivating me to do nothing except motivational things. Yeah, that exactly. Really fine. Yes, but I had so this. I had this sort of. I sort of had a bit of uh, success. Yeah. Uh, occasionally getting a sketch on it. And I mm. do mean very occasionally. And by that stage, I thought, well, I've got to have another trade. And I don't know why I thought this. I thought, well, I'll become a radio journalist. That's right. close enough. I probably was, at the back of my mind, thinking about Amanda Yunucci. Part of what informed his comedy was that he'd done courses as a producer for mm. news. Mm. And obviously from that sprang on the air day-to-day a completely new way of really doing comedy. So I did, I did this post-grad at Preston. And within a week of starting it, I knew, like, this is a hideous error. Mm. My parents were helping out. I was very lucky that they were helping out with the fees at the time. I said, this, mm. you know, to them, and, and the, they said, well, we paid for it now. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to have to do this for a year. Yeah. But off the back of that, and I was, I was, a, I was a lousy journalist, I have right. to say, to the point where they used to have these training days where they'd do a kind of a day of news, effectively, mm-hmm. and, and you know, people very ambitious. And I, I remember having to sort of be the senior news editor, and I got walked mm. all over because people just did not, you know, mm. think I had any authority. Right. But I do remember that I was so useless. One day they put me on the traffic. Could you write a traffic report? And just to amuse mm. myself, I wrote a thing that said, "Oh, um, traffic held up by a missing manhole cover. Police have issued a description of a man with a large flat circular hat." Thinking, mm. well, they won't read that out because, mm. of course not. No, of course, of course, mm-hmm. they were journalists. Of course, they read it out, yeah. and then everybody just looked at me and go, "What? What was that?" Can you in and out? That was yeah. it. They read it and out it went. Well, yeah. they, in fairness to them, like the context was making a news program. Why would they expect me to write anything? Yeah, that I guess so. Mm. But all the same, you mm. do think. Oh, this doesn't bode well for the future of journalism. <laughs> they didn't <laughs> this on the way in. A bit like Anchorman, isn't yes. it? Yes. They, they, like, they alter the hijack each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was it. Oh, yeah, they, they keep changing the auto cue. Yeah. Towards the end of that, I, there was um, a program on Radio 5 hmm. before, I think, or oh, just in the early days of it becoming a sort of all news and sport network called The Treatment. This is the only time I've showed any wit or cunning or guile hmm. that I, I sort of thought, well, all these open, the programs with the open door policy will be oversubscribed. They did one comedy program mm. called The Treatment, which is hosted by Stuart McConey. And I thought, well, they, they, it's not an open door show, but if I write to them, I bet I'm the only person doing that. So I wrote and wrote and wrote and sent them sketches week after week. And I actually got a message back from the producer saying, well, we don't really have anything, but thank you, I'm going to put these on mm. file. And a little while later, that paid off. It seemed inconceivable now, but my mum took the call from the There's a new producer came in and, and, and phoned and said, oh, I found these sketches in a, in a file. For one week, we'll commission you to write something. So Great. it's the only time I've been a commission writer ever. Um, and I did that for one week. So I have somewhere I've got a recording. Sort of, I, th- I remember it's remember day 2000, which gives you some idea of how old I am, mm. how long I've been plugging away. Uh, this went out with this sketch performed. It wasn't a great sketch, but, mm. you know, I'm, it's great because I have one of those things that you think, well, if nothing else, mm. I did this. Yeah. And that, and towards the end of the, the this, and while I was sort of trying to do this post graphic broadcast, which I was terrible at. But towards the end, somebody said, oh, there's an ad for a BBC producer, a radio comedy producer. Mm. And they badgered me to fill it in. And maybe what worked in my favour, because I never, you, didn't, you don't think that that's ever going to, was that because I didn't believe I was going to get it, I was very flippant in the application. Mm. 
So they're asking me all sorts of questions like, what was your previous job? What were the benefits? And up to that point, I said, well, one of my previous jobs was working in a shop benefits, chips. Mm. You know, what do you want me to say? So but, uh, that must have sort of given them something different, maybe. Mm. So I got an interview, and then I got a job for a year as a radio comedy producer. Great, in BBC. In the BBC. Broadcasting house. Now, if this was a film, this would be the moment in which I soared to success. I've got to tell you, no. I, oh. wasn't, I wasn't that great. <laughs> it's a very different context. This is the thing. Is sort of, I was rocketed really into position. Up to that point, I'd sort of had the old sketch. I'd also been doing a fair bit of stuff on national. They used to have a national student radio. God, this all sounds so different, doesn't it, to how it is now? But uh, a friend of mine called Craig used to do a show. So I've been doing stuff with him as mm. well. So I sort of carried on doing that at the same time. But the, this year was, it was a very peculiar year because suddenly I was in this, this, this position of ultimate authority with no real experience. And I hesitate to think of some of the screw-ups that I made. And I guess it must happen. I, again, it's one of those things you want to go back and tell yourself, look, hmm. this must happen. And indeed, um, many, many years later, I remember talking to some of the producers and saying, yeah, and they'd had all had equal screw-ups, you know. And, hmm. But at the time, it was catastrophic. You know, I ended up sort of pretty much getting fired from that job. Oh, what happened, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, I don't even want to go... Okay, that's it's, fine. It's, right. yeah, it's, too, it's, it's too raw still. Those things that, you know, people... T- t- you know, I guess your failures, your failures kind of define yeah. and propel you forward right. as much as you... I, and you took out film quotes. You, here's, yeah. here's one for you. Star Trek V... <laughs> Have you seen Star Trek V? Uh, mm, no. Don't think so. Uh, the last one I saw was when Spock dies right. and then he gets brought back. Okay. It's the new one. No, no, no. I'm talking about the, the, the one a few films after that. <coughs> Spock was back and, you know. Uh, no. no there's give a, me a quote, though. I, I want, need to hear the, the quote. quote the quote is this. Just to, to give it a bit of context. Um, the film involves uh, the main villain. He isn't really a villain. He's a guy who mm. has this weird telepathic ability to delve into your mind. Mm. And basically heal you of whatever psychological scars you have. So one by one he converts the crew of the Enterprise to his cause mm. by basically reaching into their mind and, and kind of quelling whatever internal demons they have. Mm. And there comes a point, there's a moment like Spock has been converted and yeah. McCoy's got Jim, just give him a chance. And there he comes to Kirk and he says, oh. and the phrase he uses is, oh, let me share your pain. And Kirk goes, no. Yeah. And he goes, why? And he goes, well... You think you can just heal me like, you know, my, my mistakes make me what I am. I need my pain. So right. maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that should never heal. Yeah. But anyway, that's a it's, it's, grand it's, way. That, no, I, I totally agree with you. No, I mean, that's your, that's your motivation. Yeah. That's your, 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 your fusion reactor that, yeah. that, that forms all of your, com- all your energy comes from. I mean, if your energy comes from anger... You know, yeah. great, that's it. Oh, oh, I'm angry about this. No, yeah. oh, finally, I've got some motivation to get up today. Yeah. You know, and then, yeah. or like if you're if you're miserable, well, you can convert that to anger. Well, just me, maybe. <laughs> that's, no, no, that's, that's for, for me. Misery is, mm. if, if anger is an energy, as John mm. Lydon sang, then misery is petrol. I don't know. That's mm. not, yeah, maybe. Could not be. I need to work on it. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> the, um, We're working on that motivational uh, YouTube video as we speak. <laughs> that, I mean, all of this would probably have much, much more conviction if I was a megastar. But right. I'm not. And I never mm. really set out to be, but, mm. you know. So you did that anyway. So you left the, you, you, you left the BBC. For that I didn't leave the BBC. Here's the, the next step was that I'd done the most I got off the, off the ground mm. was a, a pilot for a panel show called The Best Policy. Okay. Which has some good people in it, but due to my inexperience, complete incompetence as a producer, probably wasn't a great experience for everybody involved. But right. yeah, that's again, and I've since found out I'm probably not the worst offender mm. in that. And sometimes that's as reassuring as anything else is finding out. Well, you, you know, however bad you think you are, there's probably people worse. Exactly. In those media companies, there's an awful lot of politics anyway. Yeah, it's a fucking minefield because you can know the one person up the road or down the down the few offices down has like done twenty times way more. Worse than oh, yeah. you, yeah. but you just happen to not know the right person at that moment to yeah. get you past that little bit, and that's even more galling. Yeah, You're like, look at this asshole just fucking. Oh, down here. I, I yeah. can't for probably. I mean, I'm genuinely mm. have to avoid liability, but there were mm. seen, you know, well thought of. Mm. Well, I say well thought of, but experienced producers there who, mm. even while I was there, were, were just happily yeah. taking the piss. Exactly, um, yeah, but that, that's how it is. That, that's how those places work. But, yeah, but you, so you, you got you did that. But did you, did you perform those? Did you just write them or no, no, no. I mean, this was just production, and at the time, I was trying to. I was actually still writing, trying to get off stuff. And this is the point at which I should have really had some kind of red flag or a little internal alarm bell. Mm. Very early on, I remember saying to someone who was sort of overseeing what I was doing, "Oh, I might, I've written a sketch, and I have to go." And they went, "Oh, you know, you're not here to do that. You've got to decide what you're a writer or producer." And there's probably thinking, "Well, why can't it be both?" You know, it didn't, of course. It didn't hold back. Like, well, Manny Nucci did both. So that was the first thing that maybe actually, you know, you mm. arrived in the promised land and it's not the, the right place. I, as that was happening, as it was becoming clear, like, well, this is it, this year's coming to an end and I'm out of a job. Somebody said, oh, there's a job going at, um, 
It was called Network Z then, a station that eventually became BBC Seven, which began BBC Radio Seven, which began Radio Four Extra, and I, I sort of wound up just there, just kind of. I went and had a word with the, the lady who was in charge, a nice lady called Mary, mm. who. Uh, I'm very grateful because she didn't have any reason. I didn't really do that great at, at presenting. It wasn't so great at presenting myself. She took a punt on me mm-hmm. when she had no reason to, and I wound up sort of there till May of last year. Oh, so, wow. I, so I sort of was there, and eventually I did get to produce things mm-hmm. and make things. Not at the same pace. That was one of the things you sort of that year the, the mm-hmm. radio for, uh, to radio comedy was the the, the pace was, seems quite furious. And it's mm. only with the benefit of hindsight you think, well, that, it might have been good to, to, to sort of be working in that pace just because, you know, the more you do it, the more mm. it, normal it becomes. So I sort of wound up kind of, I guess that was a good place because I have this sort of, even now, completely obsessive interest mm-hmm. in comedy. So for an archive mm. station, which is what 4 Extra is, yeah. that was a really good handy little repository of knowledge to yeah. have and over the years that sort of built up and uh, and actually I got to work with some people that maybe I wouldn't have got to work with had I mm. stayed at Radio Comedy so I did actually want that meeting on Andy Nucci and, and, and um, yeah. uh, all sorts of people and, and to, particularly towards the end did, when... you, did you fangirl him? <laughs> <laughs> did you... I didn't, I didn't you... know. <laughs> what do I say? Oh, God, I have the opposite. This is a terrible thing. And if, if you're in this position listening, let me with a bird of my old man uh, perspective tell you this, that pe- these people are, these people, they are human beings. Yeah. And it's, it's easy to forget whether you know of someone. And I yeah. had the opposite reaction of, I become very uptight mm. and quite stern. Mm. And I had this moment when Armani oh, Nutri is going to be com- comedy controller when he phoned me at my desk and he said, hello, oh, it's Armando here. And I went, and I immediately became Mr. Formal, like, hello, yes, what can I do for you? And I really wish it, I, I, mm. I've come, he phoned me a few times, I know, a few, it took mm. a few phone calls for me to loosen up a little. Mm. And he was actually quite sort of warm and friendly in his emails and his phone calls, mm. but I wish I'd been more relaxed mm. and sort of made more of that kind of that little encounter. But yeah, but, yeah. but the thing I do remember doing was, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember this, the early, this is the early 90s, he did, he was a little count of the, the best sitcoms based mm. on a public vote. And I think he wound up on a live televised panel with uh, Clarissa Dixon Wright, mm. who was one of the uh, sort of TV chef at the time. Mm. And a friend of mine bet me that I wouldn't mention this in an email to him. She said, mm. "Why don't you ask him if Clarissa Dixon Wright smells of game pie?" <laughs> and I did. I put it in an email. I just put it. By the way, does Clarissa Dixon Wright smell of game pie? <laughs> Never mm. had an answer. Oh no! So, so he's very diplomatic, but you know, mm. people people often is like. Uh, Probably yeah. was inappropriate. So, probably sorry, Armando, if you're listening. Probably, probably trying to make up for all those conversations where you've been really stern. He and was just like, repaying the phone. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, well, look, look, he was really stern now, so now he's just loosening up a little bit. We've yeah. balanced it out now. We could probably high five on the way down the hall. <laughs> Good job, right? Yeah. yeah, I know. That's brilliant. He, he was, a, he was, a, he was a, a proper gentleman, very nice man. He was like, oh, well, they're all really good. Most people I work with, you know, very, feel very honoured and privileged to have done so. That was, and then when yeah. did you first like go, right, I'm going to perform this now? I've done the writing and the producing. When can I? When have I got? When well, here's I the thing: writing again. This is. Uh, uh, I'm assuming, by the way, I'm making this very arrogant assumption. People listening are keen to hear my advice, but if I have any wisdom to share, this is it. The, sort of going down the, the kind of route of writing because I've had sporadic success. This is frustrating. Again, my TV is this weird thing of little pockets of stuff that never quite add up to what I want them to. But um, I did have a spell writing for program Radio One comedy. This is the thing I never mm. quite sort of must the Radio Four, but Radio all the radio stations, Radio Five. Mm. You know, um, I'm fairly certain I had a sketch on Radio Two at some point. The, but Radio One did a comedy program in the mid noughties called The Milk Room, mm. which had a similar. Had this avowed intent was to sort of harvest the groundswell of, of writing that wasn't maybe going to get an airing on Radio Four. So that's might have been my most consistent run of success, and that was thanks to a producer called Colin Anderson, whose name podcast listeners will now be familiar with because that is where he's he sort of uh, scored maybe uh, the most acclaim outside of being a really good radio four producer. Mm. He sort of works with Jesse Thorne now, right. if you know that. So he's he's quite uh, he's uh, ascended to the big league. So mm. again, he's someone else to whom I'm very grateful for the opportunity. But off the back of that, I thought well, it would be a good thing while I'm doing this, while I'm feeling confident, while I'm having this sort of success, to actually try and perform. I sort of wrote a set and did my first gig. Um, what year was that? Oh, I'm very cagey about this. Okay, sorry. Uh, no, 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 because, pure, pure because it, it becomes difficult to pinpoint when I probably started stand-up, right. because I did that, and I, I had sort of a year of doing that, and then I stopped for a year, and then I did it for a year, and I was, people, you have to find that people have stopped starting. And we get to the stage where my mum died, it stopped me doing anything, really, mm-hmm. for a year. I sort of started up again. So I always think around about 2010, 2011 is when I properly started getting on the circuit. Because prior to that, the gigs I'd done, uh, sort of semi-regularly, were with a particular figure from open mic comedy, 
uh, from whom I okay. now wish uh, yes, to distance fine. myself. Yes, okay, that's fine. I yeah. think, don't make expression, you probably know who this I is. I know who you mean. Anyway, yeah. so we can cut that. That's okay, no, no, that's fine. It's, 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 but it's yeah. one of those things. But you don't know, do you? You don't know where to go. You're just looking for places you to perform. You and and people might have done, because I did it for a long, long while mm-hmm. with, with that particular guy. People said, why don't you do, why don't you go somewhere else? Why are you doing this? It's like an mm-hmm. abusive relationship. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, that's good advice, but it's difficult to take when you're on the, you know, within something like that because what mm. people are effectively saying is, why don't you just start again? And that's yeah. really difficult. Mm. I wound up doing it anyway mm. because things just got to the stage where they couldn't continue. Mm. Um, so, and, and you actually, that's when you actually find, like, oh, it's probably not as daunting as I thought. Mm. Like a lot of things, it's like the fear of it is maybe a little bit greater than the mm. actual threat of doing it. And I remember my first gig because I, it, it seems inconceivable now, but I could not imagine what it would be like to do it. I really mm. couldn't. And that was the stunning. It was like, I cannot conceive of what this will be. And I was so nervous yeah. and I was so sort of on edge that um, you get that kind of white hot sensation mm. of when you do it for the first time. And it was a real emotional sound barrier that you mm. crash through to the point where I was supposed to do five minutes. I came off stage to just go about doing 15 and they'd let me do it because I was so sort of hyper and, and adrenaline charged mm. that it, somehow it was, I guess it must have been an infectious. They didn't feel mm. a need to sort of pull me off stage mm. before that. And I was thinking, oh, wow. Mm. And people often say that's a bad thing. If your first gig was a good one, that's mm. a bad thing because it lulls mm. you to a false sense of security. Most people have a bad gig and they, mm. they, they sort of, they then... Quit. Oh, they quit. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Or they up their game or they do whatever mm. they've got to do. Yeah. That I had the same good. issue, to be honest. I had first really good first gig. Yeah. Second gig, terrible, fucking awful. Oh, the no. worst ever. And then, I can't actually remember my second yeah. I remember for a while it wasn't <clears> too bad. It's only sort of when I started yeah. doing it more maybe that it became obvious like, oh, well, not every gig's going to be a good one. Because you sort of... Again, you have that very... I have anyway. Mm. Simple mentality. When it goes well once, that's it. It's like that's it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Mm. You don't realize that I'm actually. Take me this long. I'm 40 now. Take me to my 40th year to realize actually, life mm. is a question of vigilance. That you mm. actually have to keep plugging out and, and mm. you know accept that it's an ongoing process mm. rather than you know incremental change. Yes, mm. it's not a plateau. Mm. You don't sort of suddenly ascend to godhood and yeah. stay there. <laughs> and that was my point about, up. Yeah, that was my point about the writing as well. Is that probably for some people, maybe who are hearing this, um, I don't know how they would have come to this podcast uh, and, and how they feel about again my wisdom being shared. But mm. getting a sketch on egg, doing that thing is only sort of part, part of it. It's then mm. you've got to kind of be consistent, and mm. that's probably a trickier part than getting there in the first. Like, a bit like you know weight loss. They say mm. getting the weight off yeah. is the first battle. The next battle is keeping it off. Mm-hmm. And so, it's that keeping us keeping it going, what have you. What was the biggest challenge you faced when you had to go and perform? What was the thing? Like nerves maybe, or what was it anxiety? Or... Do you know what? I don't know. I think it was probably all of it. I think it was just like, will I remember everything? Mm. What how, just how will it feel mm. to be have people looking at me, to be visible to that extent mm. and audible to that extent and not, you know, sending a script or someone but actually speaking my own words. Mm-hmm. Um, do you know that's a good question I haven't actually thought about it I don't know what the biggest challenge just doing just all of it just doing it mm. it was like multiple things at once yeah it's been plates in there yeah it? that's it and it's sort of a, the, the, well, the technique they use for dealing with fear is flooding for some people that you actually confront your fear so much that you have mm. no choice but to deal with it I know that in subsequent gigs my big issue is remembering everything and that still mm. is a thing but mm. I think the more relaxed you are on stage the easier it becomes to um, you know keep stuff in your head mm. Uh, and also, you, you don't have to. Well, you don't have to remember it verbatim. Mm. It's only better if you can play with whatever you're doing, and, and, and sort of, you know, it's malleable. It shouldn't be a, a script test. So mm-hmm. There's more value yeah. in live and connected with them. Yeah, that's and it. Stay in the room rather than just back in your head. Go, oh, what's the next bit? Yeah. Or oh, well, this is a nice crafted piece which I'm going to deliver yeah. with no energy or joy whatsoever. Yeah, that's um, it. Or it's going to sound like so over rehearsed and not exactly. at all natural. Oh yeah, this is off the cuff, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as my eyes roll back in my head like a zombie yeah. and, and so how many shows have you done now Declan? oh god I don't know I don't know if I've ever started counting but if you top them all up it must run into the hundreds I, I mean it's like I mean like but it, it's it, I mean it's in fringe shows you've been to oh, fringe how shows. many times now any other festivals you've done other festivals around no, the country I haven't. That's as well? thing. I'm sort of, I still feel like I'm at the beginning really of, of all of this stuff that it's mm. the more you do it the more you realise how vast a distance you have to cover and how many steps that will take but I've been, I don't know if I've ever actually done a show, I've been part of shows. I think mm. last year and the year before, the closest I've come to sort of doing a thing on my own, in that I was doing a three-hander in 2015 and a two-hander in 2016. And mm. um, so those, that's, again, that's another step of being slightly more visible, slightly more mm. connected to what you did. Um, to what you did. Not that I wasn't connected before, but a little bit more, like where I'm responsible for the well-being of these shows, and, which is a learning curve in itself. Doing an actual show on my own, I don't know if I'll ever be ready for that. But. So you did two hundred last year. Yes, 
Oh, this year, sorry. This I, year, I, I think about 20, No, yeah, I always think of it as, you know, school year, Edinburgh is the end of the year. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's like a tax thing, isn't it? It's yeah. like, oh, that's it, it's over, yeah. the year's that's over. It. We're just coasting now until December. And you said you had a problem with the name earlier. Oh, season. God, yes, we were talking earlier on, weren't we? The, yeah. uh, me and Matt Duell, with whom mm. I was doing the show, had settled on the title Too White, Too Furious. But then we realised on the app that would shorten down to Too White, and we we realised we'd probably get... Shall we say the wrong audience? Because, although, as Matt has pointed out on stage, who knew that would be the growth market yeah. in 2016? There you we go. could have been coining it in now. Why don't you just do it next year? That's that'd yeah, be perfect. Is, I think you've got another maybe four, maybe eight years to do that show. <laughs> yeah, that would yeah, get, get 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 some of that uh, that supremacist dollar. But so in, in the end, we went with Niche Rebels, was the mm. one thing, which was one of our second choices, I think. Which I'm, I'm quite pleased with. My, it was my idea. Too. Mm. That was my phrase. That was mine. What room, I did that. What room did you have this year? This year we're in the 48 Below Bar, which is a very nice place, but it was quite far out. Right. Which, were, which The learning curve, you always learn something different each and every you do. Mm. But this, the learning curve this year is on the more practical side of things. Mm. Not that, our, the, you know, that any comedy doing is perfect, as mm. we've said, it's an ongoing process. But that was more a factor this year, I think, of realising, oh gosh, we're quite far out. And that, the reason maybe people aren't turning up to see this is because it's quite a commitment. So to any, again, anybody who's listening who, who came to see the show, thank you so much. Mm. Because it was real coming. It was 17 minutes walk, I think, from the middle of Edinburgh. Wow. So the fact that anybody showed up to it is probably mm. quite a, a yeah. thing in itself. So, you know, thank you to uh, the, the handful of select people who saw it. I think mm. there were days when it was more of a comedy lap dance than it was an actual show. It was, it, Isn't it that every night, really, though? <laughs> <laughs> to an extent. Look at me. Here's the real me inside. <laughs> and take the layers off. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's, um, there's striptease and there's a private booth. And there's, there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's doing it deftly and there's just rough and ready, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's it. it. That's it. There's that's a first line service. Again, yeah. we're, you know, we're grateful to people, for, you know, the, the, the audience of two you mm. know, that we had from time to time was, was uh, equally as welcome. You have a show in the in your mind at the moment? I have it in my mind. It's not anywhere else at the minute. And so. are you going to do a two-hander this year as well or are you going to do a full show? Do you know what? I don't know. I don't know that I have any. And again, I don't know if I have the kind of profile that would work. Again, mm. the learning curve from last year was like, oh, unless you're very well known... Mm. We were out near um, the stand, and uh, oh. our thinking on June, sort of like everything when he was, oh, well, maybe we'll get some of the overflow, pe- overflow from mm-hmm. people. But actually, you know, unless you are Stuart Lee, when mm-hmm. they have Stuart Lee nearby, why yeah. would you And the largest, largest audiences we had who enjoyed it were people, you know, who'd come, we'd shown up on the app. Mm. when Stuart Lee wasn't doing a show oh. that kind of thing mm. so in that sense we were quite justified Matt had a really good instinct for that but again it was a real sort of round home well you really not Stuart Lee mm. so you know so whether I've got the enough cachet and pull yeah uh, to, to sort of be able to make that bold kind of move of, of oh, here's a show all about me yeah. is, uh, is a mm-hmm. whole thing you've done loads of writing then you've been a producer writer you know you're performing you're writing stuff now that is more is it is more heartfelt or for the fringe stuff because it's, it's separate isn't it you've got I, your stand up and you've got your fringe right I guess so I don't know I sort of do one tends to bleed into the other for me I'm not yet at the, the stage where I've done, I've done a sort of fully formed show or anything so mm. I tend to think just in terms of sets or what have you but mm. I don't know I, I sort of I've had moments on stage where I've talked about me and stuff that I've done or stuff that you know has happened to me, but I I don't know. Here's the thing. I mean, uh, comedy has uh, it seems to me anyway. This is purely from my perspective has moved towards more a sort of uh, I don't want to say identity politics because that sounds uh, quite a dismissive phrase, and, I, and it is a good thing because it means a lot of disenfranchised people mm. are um, you know gaining a voice, and they're mm. doing it through comedy, which is the best way of doing it, mm-hmm. and, and they're really really good at it. Some excellent writers and and what have you but I always think like as a white middle class man I'm actually quite boring <laughs> as you're finding out um, no, and, not no, no. <laughs> and I sort of think well how much how much of value is it for me to talk about it? I, I'm, I, again like I say I've got a very singular CV very singular upbringing it seems to me I've not met many people who sort of uh, nothing stunning but again I feel often that I'm I don't really the mundane you feel that you're not not, not enough well, not even that. It's just yes, I have had a very singular, like I say, very unique. Mm. If you can be very unique, unique. I'll free phrase that. I feel like you know everyone's background is unique, and mine seems, in a way, in a very small way, more peculiar than most. But at the same time, there's an awareness of like, well, oh, you know, is it that interesting? And I'm sort of interested. I think trying to anticipate the next swing in comedies, maybe it'll go back more towards sort of abstract thing. It's weird now. I never thought it would. Uh, you always think the things you're enthused about when you're young will be there forever, but. It feels a lot like we've moved away from sort of the Chris Morris thing of, I don't know if you remember Jam or Blue Jam, mm. idea, where it was brilliant comedy, but it was so sort of abstract and cerebral. 
And to the point where there wouldn't even be like a list of people in it, there'd be no credits. You'd have no idea who's done this and why. And there's a real yeah. guerrilla aspect to it. And I think, like I say, that you know, it's a great thing that uh, people are talking more about their identity in the background. Oh no! Anything. Spilled tea all over That's myself. Right. Yeah. I'm out of control. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's getting passionate. That's I like that. Like, like, like the deck, I'm just passionate about the comedy. It's like, it needs to be more abstract. <laughs> yeah. oh, I don't know if it needs to be, do you know what I mean? It's like, it feels like that is. People, like I say, if you grow up in the 80s and 90s where comedy was a very, very surreal mm. uh, entity. Like with Harry Hill, it's like if you sit through a, a whole yeah. Harry Hill show, you don't really learn anything about him. No. You know what I mean? It's like you're not mm. really acquainted with him as a person. That's true. Maybe that'll be the next move for him. I don't know. He'll sort of talk about himself. But um, if, uh, And again, it's, it's no bad thing to, to be talking about yourself. But I sort of think, oh, it'd be great to sort of... Actually, as we are entering a phase in world politics where mm. the issues are so much bigger than... Than me or serve up my take on it, but actually the things to think about are because I missed that. We're talking about Hitchhiker's Guide. It feels like mm. that was a unique moment in comedy history, and people were actually doing comedy about mm. huge ideas, like about the universe and life mm. and time. And mm. I don't know if you remember a, a contemporaneous with Hitchhiker's Guide, a program called Whoops Apocalypse. Mm. No, the guys who wrote it, Andrew Marshall and David Renwick, were sort of contemporaries of Douglas Adams, and indeed, I think they'd written together on a, on a couple of radio shows, but. But that was about the end of countdown to the end of the world, right? And you feel like, oh, that's, oh, I feel like that's sort of missing a little bit. Is that people mm. are actually going, you know what? There's, t- I mean, people are talking about it, obviously. Mm. But um, now, if you watch Whoops Apocalypse, it feels more like a harrowing prediction of what's to come rather than the amusing mm. take yeah, what's it's happening at the time. Oh, God, it's imminent. Yes. It feels, yeah. It, yeah. It feels all too credible now. But that wasn't what the Bush years felt like as well, wasn't it? It was like, well, it's going to go any minute. Fuck it, let's just enjoy ourselves. Oh, I, I don't know. It feels like Bush... Yeah, that's the thing now, isn't mm. it? George Bush must be laughing away mm-hmm. now, thinking, well, you thought I was ridiculous. Look at what we've got now. And it, it does feel like, oh, this, this yeah. is... This is this One is step of, further. We're now two minutes to midnight on the Doomsday Clock, aren't we? And you feel you, I feel like, oh, maybe there's, there's room for that sort of comedy to sort of come back. We're actually we're talking about mm. things that are on a vast canvas... Uh, there probably is comedy that is doing that. I'm just you know you've got to do what you what, what you feel comfortable doing, of course. But I, I was talking to uh, John Lung last yeah. night, and I was talking about comedy, and like his stuff was talking about like because because comedy is a it's quite a navel gazing thing, you know. Like a, yeah. it, you're kind of go, oh how do I think about this? Okay, this is how I think. This is how this is present. Do your thoughts connect with my thoughts? Okay, we're, we've found some common ground. Great, let's unpack this a bit further. Oh, maybe I've showed you some things that you haven't thought about yeah. because of this, yeah. which is. Hopefully, which is most of what comedy is, because that's yeah. where you get the last is with the connection and the and the comparisons and the, the and the agreement, yeah. isn't it? It's like, oh, I agree. Laugh, great. Okay, that's yeah. normal. Great. Okay, I thought I was just weird. No, that is normal. Or that is that's just, it. Yeah. yeah, you're getting someone's perspective mm. or something, and that is certainly for modern comedy. That is what makes it funny. Yeah, they suddenly seeing things in a new light. And that stuff with like political stuff is fine, but it could be quite. It can be quite preachy as well, can't it? It's like, oh, well, this is what it is. It's a big idea. Yeah. yeah. Which is fine if you can deliver it deftly, but sometimes they don't want that from you, do they? Yeah. They, they see you and go, you look like this kind of person, so we can't take that from you because you, you're you not maybe one old enough to, your look is just not the correct style that we would expect from you. This is too jarring. Oh, I can't listen to you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Which is, yeah. what you know, I, I'm not, sh- but again, it all takes practice. And, and I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, like I say, I'm just practice. thinking this out loud yeah. now, but yeah, yeah, it's, so you're trying to find that, that voice of yours on stage then really. The yeah. Moment. That's what you're yeah. looking for. You're looking for that, that thing that's yeah. is most definitely I, you. I feel like you know, we already have some kind of identity, but I'm, mm. I tell you, I'm not one for sort of, um, they always say you should record your act. I've not done that too many times, and I, because I, became, I feel like I've become too self-conscious when mm-hmm. I sort of start down that road. So I feel like I have developed an identity of some kind, but I don't necessarily know what it is. Yeah. You got to keep moving forward. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. You're to rock you again. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I, I don't get wrong. I'm the same. I've got. Is, like... is that my stage identity thing? I'm like Rocky Balboa. Well, that's not a bad thing. He does win. He loses the first couple of fights, but like okay. he, he does win in the end, doesn't he? So I'm sort of crafting what well, I think of carefully um, uh, created little gems of comedy, and the audience are just hearing Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. the, but the montage is going to be the most boring montage in the world. Really, really. <laughs> yes. just like a guy in a room with a notepad, and yeah. then just like just going, oh god, yeah, tapping, this tapping oyster card in there, yeah. yeah. scrunching up paper, yeah, into the just, bin, just staring out the window. Yeah. A lot. Just, I'll yeah. put the kettle on again. Another comedy. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Watching some more Netflix. Yeah, that's it. Oh, I'm finished this. Oh, I should do something now. Ah, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's up to me. <laughs> yeah, I'll have another. I'll have another glass.
Yeah, I'll just yeah, I'll just finish the bottle. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, uh, yeah, no. So I, I I feel like I have some sort of identity, and I hope I've got some sort of identity. It Mm. feels like I have Mm. uh, some kind of style. You You think sometimes that you don't have an interesting identity when, and you're like, we've got the same, all got the same perspective on this, haven't we? No, no, we do not. That's true, actually. We, we, We definitely don't. Because when you like sometimes when you, the highlight of that is when you do a new material and I go, do you not all think this? And everyone goes, no, we fucking don't. I, think I that. had that very experience on Monday night where I think because I was riffing off the back of something another actor had said about, um, isn't it great? Isn't it? And it was a brilliant bit of material. I think it was Lee Kern who did a brilliant thing about the one thing he was talking about identity politics. He's saying that that now we're sort of people are flagging up their identity much more. But isn't it? Isn't it a great thing that we all go to the toilet? Which is something maybe the starting point of many people. But the way he explained it was like, you know, you're with your friends and then you do this ridiculous thing, go into another room. I won't give you the whole material because it's, it's sure. his joke and it's better if you hear it from him. But off the back of that, I said, oh, I just want to build something Lee said. Is there anyone else think sex is just a terrifying thing? People looking at me blankly. I was going, you physically merge with another person. Does that not give anyone else the screaming heaves? And I said, the audience has one man go, nope. We, we like it. There's like, oh, okay. So would be a guy that said that, though, wouldn't it? Oh, no, God damn it. <laughs> yeah, 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 it would be. Sitting in the most alpha male pose possible. Just speak for yourself, son. I've never had any complaints. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. But I generally thought, I generally thought if, you, if you've ever I've had the misfortune to walk in on a few people at it a mm. few times, and you just think, this just looks like a David Cronenberg film mm. to me. How does anybody agree mm. to this? Or, you know, yeah. it's, to get any... It's just a horrible mm. prospect mm. of... But again, I have to accept that um, I'm singular in that department. So you know. But that's even better. That's that's even that's good too. And you could just go well. You could just follow that, isn't it? So yeah. you are. We all have different perspectives. Even though we think that we're all the same, we are definitely not. In many things, we do, we do agree in, in yeah. life. Yeah. But there's this that, that thing inside. Like if you're, I think if you're like a, a, if you've got brothers and sisters, or you're an only child. Yeah. There's there's always that that internal solitary existence of. of the consciousness that goes, oh, well, I, that didn't work out. Oh, I've followed my brain down a rabbit hole that no one else has followed yeah. me down. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm here on my own. Oh, well, yeah. guys, welcome. You didn't, oh, you don't, you don't know that? Well, we, well, let me just show that to you. And then they go, fuck it, we don't ever want to see that again. Yeah. Then, <laughs> yeah. Which is fine. But then you have to learn to kind of, yeah. the, 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 the intricacies of like working out how, what, what I was saying earlier, like what motivates you? What, what is the thing that just kind of, just galls you or, or it gives you joy? I mean, like, I don't know about you, but I, I, I have that same obsessiveness of, I'm a, I deny joy to myself sometimes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Going, like, with the relaxation thing, it's like, yeah. God, I, I, can't, I can't do that, because if I do that, I'll relax, and then I'll, I won't be as good, or I won't, I won't if I, if I, for example, I got myself the, the comic book graphic novel, Planet Hulk. But right. I, won't let my, I won't let me read it. I won't yeah. let me again. Third person. I won't let me read. It. Yeah. Me, is that right? I don't even know. That doesn't sound right. Won't you let Winter, turn into the Hulk. I, I won't That's let Winter. <laughs> Hulk, Hulk not read comic. So <laughs> I won't let Winter read it because he's not. He hasn't done enough things to get to the point. He hasn't. He hasn't, um, he hasn't done enough or uh, hasn't proved to, to himself that he can do that again. Third person. That feels better for some reason. I don't know why that. So you deny yourself that joy to motivate yourself to do other things. Go. No, I'll do that when I've got some time and I've done everything that I need to do. Yeah. Yeah. that thing yeah. and uh, and so but those those little things that people can maybe a bit relate to make you unique but as well as they can see them go oh yeah I do something the similar to that but not completely as fucked up as that but that is fine you are still weird but I'm I, I get where you're coming from yeah. you know that's it they have the they, they have the an adjustable uh, wrench. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> yeah. you were the one wrench, but they have an adjust. Oh, okay. Well, they just kind of yeah, yeah, quite just fit, just about fits. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's it. So I don't know. I'm, I'm no, no, no. Now, I, but... I think I'm going. Uh, yeah, because it, as you were talking, I was realizing that um, ideally, you'd want. I think most people aim for it was a sort of a synthesis of the personal and the abstract, mm. and that's certainly what I would like. You're talking about what motivates you. Motivated, I think I'd love to be. A fusion of Harry Hill and, oh, yeah. and Mark Steele, mm-hmm. who's another comedian I sort of admire. Mm. But you know, they seem like sort of very different forms. But what if you could bring the two together? Mm. And I realise I put myself in exalted company there, mm. alongside Douglas Adams. I don't for one second pretend I'm that good, but it, it's, it's something to aim for. Mm. And I, you're talking about you know if there's an identity to go for, like what as a middle class, uh, middle aged white guy can I say? I think the one thing that's come out of recent political developments is how much I feel like a cuckoo in the nest. Mm. 
I feel like a, some sort of weird imposter because suddenly I don't know your public self, but I feel like I thought, oh, and I was, you know, I've always had that sense of not being in step, and mm. why should I be, and why should anyone agree with me? You know, why but, so? What, what, what's the thing? Yeah. Here? What, why, but, why not in step? Is well, it, because I feel like most people, certainly on the political spectrum, are have a vastly different opinion from me, and that's fine. That's as it should be. But but I, I sorry, what's your opinion? My opinion. Yeah, what's I'm sure it's no great shock to anyone that I'm left wing, but I do feel like oh, the, the last few sort of major events we've had politically have run it home. Like oh, I'm you know oh, I'm yeah. definitely at odds with most people. Mm. Um, and uh, do you watch Humans? No. Oh, I've right, seen that yet? Enough. No, no, no. I can't. Yeah, I feel like. I'm, well, this is a reference that won't mean anything Go, to No, I'll have to watch it now. You've yeah, see, no, no, it's a great series. I've lost six months now. But I feel like I am a synth, right. a synthetic. Right. And, uh, you know, I look like them and make the same noises, but there's some sort of uncanny valley thing where people go, well, you're not one of those. That's the outsider thing, though, of, yeah. of, of the writer and the, the solitary existence of a, of a comic as well, isn't it? But it is just ever since I was a boy, and I guess that's what fuels people to do comedy. Mm. And you sort of wouldn't like, certainly people feel that way. Is there an actual mm. normal? Is there anyone who actually mm. feels normalised? And probably not, but... I do feel like, mm. particularly, what motivates me is I am so far apart from mm. the people around me mm. that, um, that, yeah, that, uh, I'd studied A-level theatre studies, Bertolt Brecht, I'm going to go put mm. a chin stroke on your ass now, Yeah. but the very, he did it, Bertolt Brecht um, this came up with the concept of the Verfremdung effect, the alienation effect, where you make people look at familiar things in a new light, mm. and the example he gave, which always tickled me, was um, instead of, we all know what a car is, mm. But you could describe a car as a windless aircraft that crawls along the ground, mm. and I've always thought well, that that is a good that is a good comedic sort of instinct. Mm-hmm. That if you make people look again at something that's familiar, I don't know. That's I don't know if that answers your question. I know you're trying to you're, you're sort of just trying to basically pull apart your like just change your perspective on life and sort yeah. of come at it from a different way. But you're talking about like uh, being an outsider and how that is. I think that's that's related to every everybody really to a greater yeah. or lesser extent. But yeah. we all feel that we're outside but I think the thing is about comedians is they admit it they yeah and yeah, they go yeah I'm, I'm definitely a fucking outsider and if you're in a, in a comic room full of comics go yeah I'm an outsider everyone goes I'm an outsider too <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to the thing we were talking about before of, uh, of um, words about nerds <laughs> it's just right. quickly, where like we, we felt like well, with, with, you know there's a lot of people who have you know there's a lot of people maybe who are taking comedy because it mm. is entering the mainstream as a thing to do mm. this is a good thing but you do sometimes feel like people are putting it on a little. Mm. That there's people who go, oh, I'm such a nerd, I've, I've, I've read Harry Potter, and you think, mm. no, it's not a nerd. Mm. You know what I mean? If anything, that is actually quite usual yeah. for people. Lots you're of people have read Harry Potter. You're a fucking norm. That's what yeah. you are. You're a norm. You're not yeah. a nerd. Yeah. The same amount of letters, but you're a norm. Okay? That's <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> That's what you are. Yeah. You're your normalness. That's it. Just yeah. exactly like everybody. Get up the same time as everybody else. Go to work nine to five, nine to six, maybe nine to six. No such thing as nine to five anymore. It's bullshit. No, no that's it's true. eight to eight to six usually as well, isn't it? Is this what it is? Oh well, I did. I mean, most of the people so you, it was ten to six. Oh, it that's was yeah, right. slightly easier. Yeah, that was oh, a, yeah. So, um, that, so that. The TV license money. Ah, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's sweet TV license that's money. It. Yeah. That's That's the thing. I, I always feel like I'm. Conscious of that, I always have to spell out to be. Well, I did. I did try and work out. Okay. I wasn't earning mega bucks. It's comfortable, yeah. but yeah. yeah. And I didn't pay for my TV license. I brought my TV in and I watched it there. So fuck them. That's it. Get me now, bastards. <laughs> we can go. Um, this whole thing has been a sting to catch you with. Don't um, have a TV. See. That's it. Don't have a TV. You don't have a TV. That's, that's it. That's true. That's very. Yeah, I had to sell it. <laughs> 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 well, it's weird. I moved into a place where I haven't got a TV. Yeah. So any time I've got the option, like just stopping at my dad's house, suddenly I've got oh, I can watch Dave Channel again. But you talk about the the nerds and the uh, how like everyone is like, yeah. I remember a boy went to one gig once, and I was like, you know, I I never feel I always feel like a an outsider, and that thing actually did happen. And another goes, yeah, I'm an outsider too. And everyone was like, you know, it was really weird. It's like, yeah. Oh, like, okay, okay. One of this is fucking lying here. Yeah. And it's not me. <laughs> yeah. I, I wasn't the first one. I said yeah. it first. Okay. Everyone yeah. else could have just fucking jumped on the bandwagon because <laughs> you all wanted to be outsiders because you thought that this was cool because you didn't want to be. Yeah. It's like one of these kids is not like the other, isn't it? It's yeah. his own thing. Yeah. And that's exactly what it was like. It was just like, oh, for fuck's sake, guys. But we're, in, you know, and they just all. Yeah, it's it just doing that same thing. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm more of an outsider than you. Like, and now everyone wants to be the most, like the the most solitary and the most uh, have, have the most tortured existence, isn't it? Because that's cool. That's in vogue. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? You see how this has been co-opted and hijacked by again mm. certain political movements that have mm. risen to prominence. That um, 
they'll always sort of trump up this thing, um, pun intended, hey. of, uh, uh, hey, always working, like a boss. <laughs> um, they, they'll sort of, they have this right. pretext of, like, you know, who's the real minority? Who's really being a It's us, we're the outsiders, really. Yeah. And, and somehow, that you know, if you're an immigrant or whatever, then, then somehow you're part of this this wave of oppression that is actually, you know, depriving people. I mean, they, well, you can't, you can't be both. You can't be in the majority and the minority. Mm. You, know, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't sort of say, well, it's, you know, they come here and, but, and there's more of us, but yet somehow we're the minority. It just, it's not an American degree, okay? You can't major in one thing and then minor <laughs> in the other. <laughs> That's it, you can't. <laughs> And you do sort of stop and you think, well, am I just assuming a position? Am I actually more normal than I realised? Which is a horrible thing when you think, well, maybe I'm more mundane than I thought. But I, I kind of think, well, there must be some spark of something that people respond to. Mm. I've been doing this a while, and mm. you know, I hope that more, you know, more people have left than haven't. And, uh, yeah. I hope that's enough for me to know that you know, there's, there's something about my perspective that isn't shared, that is entertaining to hear, and and uh, enjoy yeah uh, there is uh, and like the thing is about it is like the the more you do it the more pain you experience <laughs> yeah, the more misery more the more heartbreak the more yeah. the more the the, the 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 less money you have yes uh, and, the, and the self-esteem uh, and the the more you, you you punish yourself in mentally physically uh, everything it's just you know you will be you will get to that that quivering wreck of a human being that you want to be, where all the jokes just, just you are, that the, the come from you, come from within. You won't have to do all this research anymore. It's all right here inside, waiting for you to mine. That's what it is will be in the end, I think. Yeah. But that's, I think that's the, uh, the that's how, how well, I, sometimes it takes like 10 years to, you know, be like the best you can possibly be, or, or you know, even more maybe. You know, yeah. Like, oh yeah, I'm really fucked up now. I've been trying for so long and it still hasn't happened. Okay, great. Well, th- this is this is where my misery comes from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, great! Now we can connect with you. You were an ultra failure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, yeah, no one wants to see see the meteoric success. Yeah. Oh, hi guys. Look how good I am. Oh, fuck off. Next, get off. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> That's it, I guess. For even for successful comedians, there is that element of, uh, of I say, even for successful, immediately relegated us to outside that category. Mm-hmm. But even for you know more successful comedians, who, we'll edit that. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> good, good save. <laughs> um, the um, there is that element of jeopardy that, it, that even though they are sort of at that level, there's still something about them that it, yeah. it doesn't fit or is mm. you know it doesn't quite connect or whatever. Yeah, who was that first comic that you saw? You were like, oh man, I'd love, to, I'd love to do that. Oh, that's a good question, actually, because, um, well, that's a really good question. I don't know think about that. Who was the first comic? I can't remember the first... St- I'm, I, I know I saw Lenny Henry a few times with my mm-hmm. mum and dad when we were living in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. And, like, people, it's sort of fashionable to knock him now, but he's, he still think you know, he's mm-hmm. really he's really good. Mm-hmm. And he, he had a particular take on things mm-hmm. that was fun. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting. I always think about Lenny Henry. That, is he the, apart from Harry Hill, is he the last comedian who sort of had a very broad appeal? Because mm. he sort of, I can't imagine many comedians now who appeal to kids as well as adults. Oh yeah, I guess so. was definitely one of those. I mean, if you say yeah, because because Billy Connolly was had a massive appeal, but not he yeah. really wasn't child friendly, was he at all? Not really, mm. no. And again, that's something that maybe Jasper Carrot. Yeah, I guess I guess it I must. Have, I, remember, I must have seen lots of comics so on television. I did. There's one comic who um, a certain generation of people, I think people of my generation may remember them. Something called Roy J. This is the early '80s. Mm. Um, and this only came back to me recently. That um, I never described him. Probably lots of people go, "Oh yeah," that this was sort of on the cusp when comedy was just sort of changing. We're talking like sort of 1983 thereabouts when alternative comedy was just becoming known as a thing. So that had happened in the late 70s. Yeah, so Alexi Sale and what have you. Mm-hmm. But Roy J was sort of one of those people who's in between. He was kind of he was weird enough that you could imagine him on the alternative circuit, but somehow he was always popping up on like Bob Monkeos show and things like that. But his shtick was he sort of dressed in a very stereotypical convict's outfit mm. with sort of the arrows and the, the gloves, mm. and he had this weird sort of demeanour where he was always kind of writhing. And he sort of came onto a song and he's like, "Hey guys, mm. spook!" And he sort of that was his catch of spook, and he sort of tell. And they were quite old fashioned jokes, but he told them in a really weird way mm. that was very drawn out. Mm-hmm. And full of all these weird little diversions, and and, and like I, I've not come across a comedian like that for a long, long time. And mm-hmm. it sort of popped back into my head a few years ago. I thought, oh, and you can now track these things down on YouTube, and, and you mm-hmm. think, oh yeah, that must have been a, a factor. Because when I was very young, like seven uh, or eight, you know, my family moved around a bit when I was growing mm-hmm. up. So we lived near Blackpool for a while, which is like 
the kind of, I guess, particularly at that time, the, the face of very mainstream, like mm. Les Dor- Ooh, the funny comedian, but, mm. you know, sort of was the classic old school quiz show host type. We went to see his shows quite a lot. But so someone like that, sort of alternative comedy, I didn't really get as a kid. It's only when you get into your teens mm. you realise this is more in tune with my sensibilities. As funny as the other guys are, this is probably more speaking more to me. But he was the first one who was a bit odd. And, and you think, well, what? You know, we just not like anything mm. else that you'd see. We need to Terry Pratchett as well. No, do you know what? I'm oh. very, I'm very specific about Interesting. my geekdom. That mm. I, science fiction is my thing, but fantasy I can't get on board with. Anything right. with spells and magic, I just can't do. Okay. But I know he's been compared to Douglas Adams, and I, I sort of I can see the comparison, and mm. I can see, and I, it's one of those things I've heard it readings on radio, and I thought well, it's the kind of thing I might enjoy, but right. I can't. Okay. Dragons magic now. I would say that, okay, you don't have to go down the dragons magic thing, right? But. Mm. There was one book, which, the first book I read for Terry Pratchett was, from Terry Pratchett was Small Gods. Right. It's really, I, really, I really enjoyed that book. Yeah. The one, that was the first book I ever laughed out loud at. Great. Really good. I love, i tell you what it is, and again, this, is, this feels like something that maybe isn't, or maybe it's coming back into love a little bit, but all these people, Douglas Adams, Chris Morris, and, and all those guys, mm. um, it's their use of words, the way they mm. construct sentences. The, the one thing that lodged in my consciousness when I was 11, and I saw Hitchhikers again, mm. and I sort of had this light bulb moment, was um, the arrival of the Vogons when they show up, and it said the spacecraft, oh, what is it, the spacecraft hung in the air in exactly the same way that bricks don't. Yes. And that, that made me laugh, but it also I spent hours mm. puzzling over the grammar of that sentence, mm. that it was... It sounds wrong, but it is. It's sort of, there's something about it. I think mm. how good comedy is an ambush. Mm-hmm. There's a, a writer called Andy Hamilton. I did a program with him at Four Extra, and he said this: good comedy is an ambush. You shouldn't see where it's coming from. Mm. And that definitely just was one of those things that's so out of nowhere. Mm. They just think, how did he think of that? Mm. How did he think of that? How do you arrive at that? As a, as a yeah, Such a technique. Yeah, just just where did that come from? And a lot of Douglas mm. Adams has that really refined feeling of mm. this is so well put together, mm. so well crafted. I and mean, he, he really mined everything for comedy. But, but no, in terms of first stand-up I actually saw in person, on my own, I have a feeling it might have been maybe university. There was, um, I think it wasn't really a comedian. There's a guy called Henry Normal, who's since gone on to sort of mm. uh, do a lot of work for Baby Cow. Mm-hmm. But at the time, he was a kind of comedy poet. That's something you don't... I mean, that's something that's coming back a little bit now, but it felt like there was more of that mm. at the time, that... You'd see uh, on television, you'd see a lineup of comics, and Lem Cisse would be on the, the bill as well as you know more straight ahead comedians. But yeah, he I saw him, uh, he did a university gig. It was a university he did it with? He did it with Lem Cisse and, and a guy called Johnny Dangerously. Mm. I wonder what happened to that guy. But mm. yeah, no, that was the first time. I know, uh, <laughs> Too dangerously, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's Johnny safely now. Um, <laughs> hey, you see. Um, but I remember, all right, guys, all right. <laughs> High five. Um, <laughs> the, Come uh, on, boom. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is in <laughs> But no, anyway, no, I just remember as ever, he was the first one I made a point of seeking out and seeing. And I know mm. Harry Hill definitely in the 90s. Mm. And since then, I've seen quite a few people. Mm. I haven't got to comedy as much as I should have, I don't feel. Mm. I'm not sort of out as a punter as much these days. Yeah, it's a busman. Yeah, just because busman, because even when mm. you're watching a program, you think, oh, I want to be doing it. Yeah. Oh, I could have, that's another bit there. Did, yeah, that's yeah, another that's bit. Yeah. You, got, you did not come up, definitely? I'm sure I have. I can't think of them off the top of my head without yeah. um, delving into my diary. Are you doing just the, possibly doing the Fringe this year, or is that the only festival you do where you can do other ones this year? I don't know. It's been a reminder to apply for something at Brighton mm. Fringe, but again, it's working up the courage to do I'm at that stage where it's like, oh, if I'm going to push this on, I'm going to need confidence from somewhere to mm. sort of send a clip out to people and what have you. Okay. So. Time will tell if I find that. Um, I've been through you know, just quite a few changes in the last year or so. Right? Okay. It always, always takes away yeah. you know, your confidence to some extent. So mm. the question of building that back up, I guess. Yes, fair. Um, geeks, no, they're all, they're all little pearls, yeah. aren't they? They're all really good. Um, it's it it's punch as hard as life, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the most important is you keep getting up. And it's the harder you get punched in the face, you keep moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> That's I can, I'm going to send you those links to those. Oh, please do. I'd love to. It's awesome. Oh. It's awesome. Just as another tangent. That's the third time. I can't use it. It's a fourth time. That's, that's it. it. No, you used up the Rocky Allowance. That's it. Like, like, uh, like data for the month. You've got a Rocky Allowance. Yeah. yeah. The, the, I always think of the... There's a, do you ever heard of, have you ever heard of Big Daddy? Yeah, the film? Not the film or the wrestler. The band. Big Daddy. No. They're the sort of first ever mashup. You know the mashup genre where you get like Hacey Dixie will do a, a song in um, country style. So mm-hmm. you know, Big Bottom Girls done as a kind of fun yeah. country. Editor. This is again early 80s. They're the first band to do it. And they're brilliant. They had a backstory which was they were a 50s do-what band who were taken prisoner in I think Korea in the 50s. Mm. 
and then got, got released in the 80s. So they're, they're, there's all this conceit of like they do modern songs within a doo wop style. Mm-hmm. But if you seek out their version of uh, Eye of the Tiger, right. well, they take this very macho, testosterone driven anthem and turn it into a very pleasant, <laughs> easy listening sort of experience. <laughs> ruining it. Yes, ruining oh, it. It's, brilliant. No. it's a wonderful, wonderful it's, idea. It's, it's just it's telling, just, uh, just yeah. castrating the song. Yeah, let's say they turn it into this sort of a cappella thing. Oh, but, um, no. but it's. But it's, it's Funny, but I'll horrific. Check that, I'll check that out then, Big Daddy, yeah. Big Daddy, I'll send you a link. Right, great. Um, and people listening can find that for themselves. I just mentioned it actually because I was thinking I have three comedic heroes. Mm. And I was thinking about it, none of them are stand ups. And yeah. I think that's, that's, again, I don't know what how other stand ups are right with their material, but you feel like it's, it's it's something that maybe doesn't happen as much as people bring in the high concepts from other sort of forms of comedy. It's good, I think, if you're doing comedy to, to occasionally do sketch. Mm. Mind, just get a different mm. mode of comedy or improv or something because suddenly you realise how much you can do with stand-up. You, you're asking about, sort of, I feel like formative influences is, is not all of them, very few of them are actually stand-ups. Mm-hmm. I always think of stand-up as a separate subdivision. Of, well, I always think of the big three, Douglas Adams we mentioned, Chris Morris we mentioned, but uh, Viv Stanshall, right. who's not a name that's familiar to many people, but he was in a, a, a sort of comedy band in the 60s called the Bonzo Dog Band. Mm. who are still brilliant some of their stuff still stands up really mm. well if you go back and revisit it but he also he sort of struck out on his own he's a very 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 eccentric individual mm. again if you're listening and you want some sort of links to stuff uh, up on YouTube he did a thing called Viv Stanshaw's Week which is like a one-off special mm. which is just follows him around in the mid in the mid 70s sort of and it gives you some flavour of what he's like very very English eccentric mm. very posh sounding but he, again, he had a, a real take. He did a thing called, uh, when he left the Bond, it was called Sir Henry Rawlinson End, mm. which is a brilliant sort of monologue come story about this horrible aristocrat mm. who's just everything that's repellent about the English mm. of a class. Mm. And uh, he did all, some of that is so beautifully described. Again, the use of words is so wonderful. Beautifully described. Like, Sir Henry had breakfast, and when he broke a fast, you cursed double glazing. Mm. So economical, so brilliant, you know, just mm. vivid. Mm. Sort of up there with Mervyn Peake as a mm. use of words and what have you. So, yeah. that's so that's the mission this year, just to kind of like get things back on track and stuff. And and what I don't know. I feel like I project. Should, I mean, I, do you do? Sorry, do you do, lots of questions here. But that's right. Do you do? Do you like you self talk about improv? Do you do acting as well, or do you? I don't know. Like I said, I had a couple of acting roles by accident. Really, people I've gigged with in the open mic circuit have sort of come back and said, "I'm doing this thing. Could you do this wee tiny thing in it?" Mm. So, and I always feel like that's that, again. If I was a slightly more together person. Um, for Hitchhiker fans, someone who knows where their towel is, I would uh, mm. I would sort of maximise on that. So maybe that's the next step is actually being like a grown up, having mm. a plan. Or happy. I don't know what my mission statement is at the minute. Mm. Like a lot of us, I'm juggling sort of work, stand up, mm. and trying to find time to sort of calm down and rest a little bit, mm-hmm. and give myself a license to do that. In between. TBD, T T T B D T B D. Maybe I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Lots of acronyms. Fuck it. I'm just going to have it. Why are the people getting nosebleeds while they're listening to this? talking about I don't even Clinton know Clinton Rebel has been penetrable logic mm, so, um, mm. yeah I, I, I sort of I, I, I never know what the next step is but I guess yeah and maybe just to intensify as you said incremental steps so mm. maybe the next mission statement will be a tiny thing that will as you said keep moving forward Adrian um, <laughs> uh, in our mission to spread the word of Rocky yeah. Rocky Balboa I try to think you prompted it was probably to think about actually a lot of stuff that's influential mm. so all sorts of stuff is bubbling to the surface at the minute and just I'm sort of uh, yeah I'm trying to sort out my mind all right. uh, answers to that to that question so. Declan well thank you very much for coming on the show that's alright thank you great. thanks that's alright my pleasure and that was episode 27 with Declan Kennedy go find him on Facebook go follow him on Twitter actually just go see him live because that's where comedy lives Next week, we've got Matt Hoss for episode 28. Matt Hoss is a promoter. He's just done a master's in comedy, so I talked to him about that. Uh, I really like Matt. He's so self-aware for such a young man and a very funny comic. So that's episode 28. Now, if you like this podcast and you want to donate, just go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defect Podcast, and donate as much or as little as you want. But if you can't kick something back to us, guys, it is Christmas. Just leave us a nice, honest review on iTunes or Podbean, because that does help. If you want to follow us on Twitter, we're there, at The Comedy Defect. If you want to follow me, it's at Winter Phonander. I'm also fully moved in 
to my wife's house now, so that's great. I'm in the comedy container, so I will be cracking open that tome, the Guinness Encyclopedia, and I'll be tearing through that, rinsing that for as many Guinness Encyclopedia jokes as I can possibly muster. That is going to be on Twitter, and that is at Guinness Jokes. I've got no excuse now, guys, I really don't. Now I'm also touring a fringe show which will be called Not Just for Christmas. So I'll be doing a work in progress of that, previewing that around the country. The dates will be on my website which is winterphonander.com and also tell them to you in the next few links of the next few podcasts. As I say, episode 28 with Matt Hoss, very funny comedian, really great guy as well. That is next week. We'll see you then.